All right, uh, hello everybody. Uh, let's continue our lecture series for this uh, course, optimal control guidance and estimation. Talking about lecture number six here, uh, where we will review some calculus of variations concept. And uh, this uh, two part lecture series, and the first lecture will be taken this time, and then uh, we'll generalize some of the concepts in the next lecture. So, why do we do that? Because uh, one uh, very strong uh, backbone of optimal control theory relies on this calculus of variation approach actually. In fact, the entire problem can be viewed up, viewed as, a, a, as nothing but calculus of variation problem actually. So, that is what you will do, but typically the calculus of variation is a vast subject also in, a, in its own right. We will not talk too much details about everything that is involved, but we will just see the concepts that are relevant and then uh, we will proceed further for optimal control ideas and all that actually next. So, this is the motivation why you want to study calculus of variations actually here. So, first thing is uh, before going there a little bit of motivation we can uh, we have seen some of these things before, but let us uh, have a look at that. Uh, what is an optimal control formulation? Okay, that is what uh, we are our ultimate aim is actually. So, in a, in a way it can be summarized something like that which I think we have all I mean discussed about it a little bit before. So, our objective in optimal control problem is to find an admissible time history of control variable u of t in the in the domain t 0 to t f as t belongs to that domain. Okay, we have to find out all u of t or rather a u of t trajectory within this t 0 to t f which causes the system governed by this system dynamics uh, to follow an admissible trajectory. Okay, so, it is a control trajectory you are interested to find out. So, that uh, the state trajectory becomes an admissible uh, if you if you view it as a solution to this uh, I mean this equation actually. Also. But on the way it has to optimize that means, minimize or maximize a meaningful performance index which which can be given like that in a in a kind of a very generic form, but that does not mean that is the only form basically it can be having your own way of defining it, but it is a very generic way this is this can be defined something like that. Okay. And it also has to set it force the system to satisfy certain boundary conditions. Okay. So, what is an objective? Objective is all that our objective is to find a some sort of a control, uh, I mean, control trajectory in this domain so that it will satisfy all these uh, nice things actually. It will uh, give a solution of the state which is admissible, it will minimize or maximize a cost function, and it will also satisfy certain boundary condition with both initial condition as well as final condition actually. That is our objective. And obviously, it falls in the framework of calculus variation because this is a path dependent optimization what you are talking about here. And then there is a dynamic systems involved in the process actually. So, at a point it does not make too much sense, but as a evolution in time it makes a lot of sense actually. So, looking at this particular cost function, okay, you can talk we have again discussed this a little bit before as well. So, if you talk about minimum time, then I can talk about minimizing this fellow and hence I can select phi 0 and L 1 in this, this thing. 0 it is 1 then it is nothing but uh, T f minus T 0. So, that is what I want to minimize here actually. Okay. Now, if you want about minimum control effort and this is uh, this is what I will do this is I will put it as 0 and this L I will take it as something like uh, U transpose R U. Okay. Then if I do, if uh, that means uh, I am minimizing the control effort in a way actually. So, this means uh, phi is 0 and L equal nothing more like that actually. And then, if you talk about minimum deviation of a state about C with minimum control effort, this uh, this helicopter hovering sort of ideas that I discussed before as well. So then, uh, you can select something like this. In other words, uh, your L becomes like that, and again phi is zero actually. Okay. So like that, you can variety of things you can talk about. And uh, this particular thing talks about something like a terminal time dependent uh, of a component of the J, and this talks about some path dependent T zero to T F. What is happening on the way actually? So, this is what happens at T f and this is happens at what happens from T 0 to T f. Okay, this is this these two components are built around that kind of ideas actually. So, this is how you can do that and again if you talk about minimum deviation of state from origin and things like that uh, then it is uh, gives a standard uh, uh, kind of quadratic regulator sort of ideas actually then uh, you can take at least something like this. And okay, if you want to minimize the control while the final state reaches close to a constant value. Now, this is this must be an error quantity you want to minimize that then you, you can talk about a phi component now at equal to T f this has to minimum on the way you want to control effort to be minimum. So, L has to be like that actually. So, various things can be defined they are just uh, just token a uh, kind of uh, examples out of ocean actually. So, you can think of your own problem and construct your cost function your own way actually. 
So, the if you just see that this particular problem is directly falling under the calculus of variation problem because you are interested in in finding a straight trajectory finding a control trajectory which will ultimately also give you some sort of admissible straight trajectory. So, it is actually a trajectory finding problem sort of thing and the with respect to those kind of trajectories our everything is optimal lecture that means the cost function is uh, either maximum or minimum that we want to do as well as it satisfies the boundary condition etc. So, directly it falls on the calculus of variation that is why we are interested to see some concepts of this uh, this calculus of variation actually ideas there. All right. So, before that there are a little bit fundamental theorems of calculus as well uh, as if we, this talks about something like derivatives of integrals and all that it is just good to know that actually that what is happening here. Now, we know that uh, the, the, the limits are constant numbers actually and the integrals do not contain any function of state and think I mean function of this x variable then it turns out to be 0, but what happens if the limit itself is a function of state actually I mean function of the free variable then what happens the d by d x of this quantity happens to be f of x provided f of x is continuous actually. These are something directly from calculus not not really calculus of variations actually uh, advanced calculus actually. Now, what happens uh, these two limits are constant, but uh, inside the function inside the integral you have a function which is a function of the the dependent variable then what happens actually. It is integrated over y, but uh, the result is a function of x. Remember this this integral is integrated over y. So, y is gone actually because that will be evaluated eventually, but it ultimately it will result in a function of x. So, that you can talk about derivative of x actually. Okay. So, this this result is given something like that provided if this f of x has continuous partial derivative of del f by del x actually. Okay. Then uh, you have something like a little bit extension of that and you tell okay now what if in addition to that condition my limits are also function of free variable okay. uh, psi 1 and psi 2 instead of constants a and b we have these functions now coming there actually. Then it satisfies something very close to that what you know here plus additional components actually. So, this this will be something this okay, what you have here plus this uh, this two components will come here actually okay. and some of these things will be used uh, in our calculus of variation analysis concepts also it will give you some transversal, transversal eddy conditions ideas and all that actually see that there. Okay. Well, anyway, so this is just a quick glimpse of these theorems 1 to 3 which we do not want to prove here or anything, but with this uh, background in mind we go to this calculus of variation concepts actually. So, what is the difference between calculus and calculus of variations? On one hand we talk about functions which is the part of the calculus and the other hand we talk about functional actually okay. and what is functional you can think of uh, something like a function of function sort of thing actually. So, j is a function of x, but x itself is a function of t. Okay. So, that kind of thing we talk about a functional basically okay. and typically these functionals are also kind of uh, I mean scalar values and things like that ultimately it will be integrated once you integrate and uh, it will ultimately result in some sort of a scalar value actually. But anyway, so that is uh, coming back to that uh, function is uh, something defined like this to each value of the independent variable there is a corresponding value of the dependent variable and we can uh, know these functions uh, from very basic ideas and all that actually. So, I do not want to describe too much on that, but as a functional to each function there is a corresponding value of the dependent variable actually. Okay. So, that is uh, I mean in a way you can it feels similar basically, but uh, what in a I mean if you just look at a kind of a intuitive idea sense then this is a function ok one is a independent variable and they have got a function and it is a function of a function basically ok. So, that in that kind of ideas you can it actually ok. So, here the difference is to each value of the independent variable there is a corresponding value of the dependent variable. And here the difference is to each to each function. So that's, that's the difference actually. To each function, there is a corresponding value of the dependent variable. Okay. Here it is a dip, uh, to each value of the independent variable, there is a corresponding value. But here is a to to each function, there is a corresponding value actually. Okay. So that's that the difference there actually. Okay. Now you have talk about uh, what is increment of a function. Obviously, it is defined something like that: x of t plus delta t minus x t. And uh, what is this here? Increment of a functional. Then you talk about j of x t plus delta x t and this delta is denoted something like this and this itself is a function of t you know that. Okay. So, and then this this will give you some sort of a increment of a functional uh, in the sense this minus that will give you some delta j basically. Okay. Pictorially also uh, it is possible to denote we will see that in a second actually. Now, delta j okay, if you talk about that uh, what about some sort of a small uh, kind of example 
talk about j is something like this ok. So, the delta j by definition turns out to be like that just from this this definition actually. So, you have j of x plus delta x both, both are functions of time again minus j of x of t and j of x of t is defined something like that. So, I can put it somewhere like that, but j of x plus delta x I can evaluate wherever x is there I will put x plus delta x and then make it square and things like that. So, then I will integrate I mean I will uh, kind of uh, combine the two integrals and cancel out some terms and things like that. That way I will uh, this 2 x square and 2 x square and things like that will go all ok. So, what you will what you will be left out with this kind of a quantity actually ok. So, as long as I know this delta x of t ok as a function uh, in its own right then I can talk about evaluating this integral along with uh, this x of t actually. I, I have to know both x of t as well as the corresponding variations throughout the time domain. Then I can evaluate this uh, this corresponding delta j basically ok. Now, this is uh, picturally representing something like this. So, this is a uh, function and its increment. If you have a function and independent variable in the x axis, you have a functional and a independent function in the y axis I mean x axis ok. So, you, that is what instead of a value you talk about some sort of a value of the function itself basically x of t okay. all right. So, the uh, in other things will remain same I mean if uh, whatever happens here as a as a independent variable sense will happen everything will happen here in this function space actually in, the, in this function sense basically. But remember this itself is a function x of t itself is a function actually you are just evaluating that function at a particular value of time and then uh, interpreting what is happening there actually. Okay. So, you talk about a, a let us say increment delta t you talk about a variation delta x okay. and then talk about some the, this is a df this is delta j things like that actually. And typically we will uh, even though we know that this is a kind of uh, I mean suppose you change the function from here to here this independent variable then the function goes from here to there. But if you put a first order approximation this is just like a kind of a linear approximation sort of thing and then go up to that point then you will end up there actually you will not end up there. Okay. So, that is the defect thing and all that that is the error quantity basically. Similar thing will happen also here you will go there but ok this will be the error quantity actually. Okay. So, most of our analysis will remain uh, limited to the first order sort of thing actually. Okay. So, that is why this pictorial representation has some meaning actually there and more than that you can say you can read from this book actually. Okay. So, how do you calculate whatever you define as differential of a function it turns out to be variation of a functional here. Okay. So, what is differential of a function delta f star is nothing but f of t star plus delta t minus f of t star and then you can evaluate it that way. So, it turns out to be d f and this uh, is uh, kind of defined as d square f and things like that. So, uh, this is how it is and then if you talk about uh, delta t goes to 0 then you talk about the divide this both sides by delta t and then take delta t going to 0 then it so happens that d f by d x and all that is first order term and all that, that way actually. So, you you end up with some approximations which uh, which talks about uh, that actually d f is nothing but f dot into delta t in general that is what I told you here d f is nothing but f dot into delta t that is what you get it there actually f dot is the slope and delta t and then d f is that actually. Uh, okay, so, this is how it is, but coming to the other side of the thing variation of a functional you can again talk about very similar and then first variation second variation like that you can talk uh, and then you will end up with something like this actually ok. So, most of the time we will be worried about first variation ok and that will be defined something like that way and second variations are uh, important only for sufficiency check and all that later ok. So, very I mean one class later probably we will talk about that a little bit. Okay. So, what you are talking here is uh, result 1 ok what is uh, derivative of variation is variation of derivative and result 2 which talks about integration of variation is variation of integration. It may sound trivial and in the proof happens to be very trivial also, but it is a very powerful implication actually ok. So, what you are talking here derivative of a variation this is this is by definition like that this is a variation quantity and this is d y. Ok. Now, ok what you are talking here by the way all this uh, ok let me see whether I have a picture somewhere ok this is what it you are talking about. So, it is actually a x of t ok what you are de dealing here and some x star of t ok and the difference between that is also a function right. I mean if you talk about various values of uh, this x axis you will get various values of this difference actually the difference is nothing but delta x actually ok that is what you are talking. So, if you have a path 
we are talking about a variation around the path that means, I will take some other alternative path around actually, okay, that is the concept of variation actually. Right. Okay. So, this is what I am talking here actually. Okay. So, you can see that this is the uh, variation and then derivative of that and then simply use the definition of this variation x minus x star and then it will just evaluate the derivative okay. and this two difference is nothing but the variation of x dot by definition again. Okay, this the this sum derivative minus sum derivative of star value actually. So, is, uh, by definition, it is nothing but delta of x dot. Actually. Again, very same algebra, very similar algebra. You take the integration and then uh, put it back the definition and then separate it out. It can be done because both this derivative and linear operators are actually linear operators. That's that's why it happens actually. Okay. Talk about uh, this uh, separate it out and by definition from here is nothing but variation of this function. Okay, this functional actually. So, you consider this integration itself is a functional, okay. then it has nothing but variation of that function. Okay. So, what you are talking about is uh, integration of variation by definition like that is variation of integration which is that by definition like that. Okay. So, very simple two line proof, but uh, very powerful results as we see little later actually. Okay. So, first thing uh, some exercise for the variation of this particular functional, how do you do that? And also a some small uh, kind of comment, if it tells you that uh, okay, just evaluate the variation that means, uh, we mean first variation not mean any second third variation and all that actually. But, okay. So, by default variation means first variation actually. actually okay. So, we talk about uh, this problem, we want to evaluate the first variation or just the variation of the j. Then uh, method 1, we can just go to definition brute force way of doing that, then put the j and then try to expand it, okay, put the definitions and then land up with some, some expressions like that. Okay. And remember uh, second order, third order the variations are neglected, so you can neglect all these terms and you land up with something like this actually. Okay. What about method 2? So, this is uh, you can directly go to the result. Okay, this is the result that we discussed. Uh, this one. Okay, then you can simply put it back here, and then uh, then evaluate this del j by del x. Okay, directly. Okay, then you can excite this idea of variation of integral is integral of variation here. Okay, that means this is uh, what you are talking about is uh, like this. Okay, because this one can be pushed inside now. This integral actually. Okay. So, then you can land up with something like this. Okay. Okay, directly you are taking help of del j by del x evaluation actually, that is the, that's the difference and that simplifies your algebra okay. and you will end up with something like this actually. Okay. Because this derivative can be pushed inside, these limits are constant now, it can be pushed inside and then you can, uh, you can have a simplification term 4 x plus 3 here. Yeah, so that is how it happens there. Okay, now, uh, uh, what is this uh, some boundary condition ideas and all that? Uh, remember this optimal control problem also talks about boundary conditions and here you can talk about a variety of boundary conditions. It can be fixed endpoint, free endpoint, partially fixed, partially free something like that actually. So, when you talk about uh, fixed endpoints, what you are telling is uh, at t 0 my x of t 0 is a fixed value and at T f my x of T f is also a fixed value. Okay. So, this is uh, like uh, you to your solution is to satisfy this kind of endpoints actually. T 0 x to x of T 0 is a is a number I mean specified number and T f and x f is also a specified number actually. So, that is kind of uh, fixed endpoint problems okay. and free endpoint problems is uh, can be both ways that means, uh, it is either completely free and we do not really care about where it lands and things like that or it may be required to lie on a curve actually. Okay. Many of these things uh, practical examples will probably demand that. For example, uh, if you really want to launch a satellite and you go and launch a satellite uh, anywhere in the orbit is fine actually, because uh, once you have once you satisfy the orbital conditions, it will keep on revolving in the orbit anyway. Okay. So, that is your job actually, it does not matter which, which point you, join, you can join the orbit with the orbital conditions at the point. Obviously, if you consider that, that is nothing but a function. So, orbital equations will happen to be elliptic and then that ellipse has a 
an equation governing equations sort of thing. So, if your variables happen to match with that governing equations, then you are fine, it, the location does not matter actually. Okay. So, this kind of problems uh, are the something like this, it may require to lie on a curve it have t actually or it can be simply completely free, you do not really worry about uh, where it goes and things like that as long as uh, it, uh, it satisfies the other objectives basically. It, in fact, if the endpoint happens to be completely free, we will have some, some term in the cost function which will give, which will kind of wind the problem in a, in a loose constraint sense, in other words soft constraint sense sort of thing. If you have a soft constraint term in the cost function, then your final boundary condition can be really free, but in a, in a, in a way it is indirectly kind of uh, directed towards that actually. Okay. okay, now what is this specified points can be like, uh, I mean, uh, okay, this x t 0 x 0 and, and t f x f specified means it can be either hard constraint or soft constraint. If it is hard constraint, we are demanding that it this value x of t 0 has to be equal to certain value and x of t f has to be equal to certain value and suppose it is a not a hard constraint but a soft constraint, you are telling okay, x of t f can be somewhere around that value. Okay. So, the soft constraint part typically goes to the cost function and hard constraint typically becomes a kind of a end point problem sort of thing. So, that means, boundary condition sense it will come actually. So, all that uh, I mean these are the concepts that you are talking about. So, the boundary conditions can be fixed endpoint conditions or free endpoint and if it is uh, fixed this way, if it is free that way actually. Yeah. Now, what do you, how do you define optimum of a function null actually? So, that is what your uh, final objective will lie there. Okay. Now, this uh, mathematically it can be defined something like this, a function null is said to have a relative optimum at x star if there exists an epsilon which is greater than 0 such that all functions x of t belongs to omega okay, that is the domain of interest what you are talking which satisfies this condition. Okay. Okay, that means, you are not allowing this variations to be arbitrarily large if it satisfy this particular condition if, if an epsilon happens to be a small quantity in general then you are allowing those variations in and around x star actually. Okay. So, for small variations any small variation you take, then uh, what happens here? Uh, the increment of j has the same sign actually. Okay. The same similar concepts that we derive from this uh, static optimization and all. If it is a minimum point, any direction you go, the function value is supposed to be more than the minimum point value. Okay. Similar thing, it is uh, any variation you take around a, around the optimum path, the optimum, uh, I mean, the ultimate uh, cost function that is uh, of interest to you has to be either the either more than that value if it is a minimum problem or less than that value if it is a maximum problem. But ultimately, the cost functional and most of the time we uh, we will talk it as a cost function also okay, both uh, with the assumption that you are talking about a functional anyway. So, most of the time what will happen is uh, uh, if you take any arbitrary variation around the optimum path, the function is supposed to either increase or either decrease or decrease basically. So, in that sense we talk that is optimum value basically. Okay. So, this is what is written here. So, if you take j of x minus j of x star, if it happens to be greater than equal to 0, for all variations delta x, we satisfy this kind of condition. Remember, this is nothing but delta x actually, delta x bound, the absolute value of delta x at any point in time has to be less than equal to epsilon actually. For all small, so all such small variations, this is true, then it is called a local minimum. For all such variations, if it is, this one is true, then it is a local maximum actually. Okay. And if it is satisfied, if these conditions are satisfied for arbitrarily large values of uh, epsilon, then obviously j of x star happens to be a global optimum point also basically. Okay. If you relax yourself, then the variations need not be small, variations can be large as large as possible, then it uh, leads to the concept of global optimum actually. So, this is the concept that I have just uh, shown you also. So, the, suppose you have uh, actually found an optimum path, this dotted line, dark dotted line actually, let us say that is the optimum path. Then, if you talk about any variation around that, that can be represented like that. So, if I evaluate my functional around the solid line, I will get a, I mean, get a value which is more than the integral value or the cost functional value. Okay, if I evaluate on that path, actually. Okay. So, there are two paths here, and remember, the cost function happens to be an integral value of this uh, this functions basically. So, if I evaluate the integral taking this function, whatever solid line thing, I'll get a value which is higher than the integral value if I use the other one instead actually, that is the whole idea there. 
Now, what is this fundamental theorem of uh, calculus of variations? Uh, this is a very nice fundamental theorem here. Uh, it tells us that uh, for any x star to be can kind of a candidate optimum solution, we should have a necessary condition which tells us that the first variation is equal to 0 and sufficiency condition tells us that the second variation should satisfy this condition, either positive definite or negative definite sense actually close to what we know in static optimization ideas there, but extensions of that into dynamic optimization ideas. Then there is a very interesting fundamental lemma associated with uh, this uh, calculus of variations, which tells that uh, this kind of thing. So, for uh, sorry, sorry, if for every continuous function g of t, this is true, okay, then this has to be 0 for, for the entire interval actually. Okay. The, let me read the theorem again. If for every continuous function g of t, okay, if this is true, okay, that is a preposition actually, if this is true, okay, then this has to be true for all for, for the entire interval actually. Okay. And the only condition is delta of x that is the variation of x has to be continuous in the entire domain. Okay. As long as the variation of delta x is continuous in the entire domain, in addition to that if this is true, this integral is true then the integrand value has to be true for the entire interval. It is a very powerful theorem actually, okay. because integrand value being equal to 0 for the entire interval is something that is a very big implication actually. Okay. And that is what we will exploit it heavily in uh, deriving this optimal control necessary conditions and all that. Okay. So, we will see that. Okay. So, uh, again the, the theorem is like this and a little, uh, little proof associated with that also let us see, because it is a very important theorem as well. So, it is actually kind of a very easy to solve by using this contradiction ideas and all that actually. Okay. So, what it tells you that uh, let g of t and delta of uh, delta x of t be something like this. Okay. That means, g of t is uh, is kind of uh, uh, I mean greater than 0 okay, for all t which belongs to that okay, on small interval uh, if it is uh, it is less than 0. Okay, we are not interested in other things which is that way. Okay. Uh, and either the delta x is greater than 0 or delta x is less than 0 in this interval actually. Okay. But, uh, but it so happens that if it is true then g of t and delta x of t is, is not then I mean it is not equal to 0 that is the whole idea there actually. Okay. So, what you are talking here? We are talking of some contradiction basically. So, what you are showing we are interested to show this one. Okay. So, what is contradiction here uh, that g of t Okay, is not zero. Okay, if g of t is not zero, then it can be either positive or negative, right? That's all you are telling each other. Okay, right? Uh, that's a contradiction. G of t is not zero. If it's not zero, this can be either negative or positive. I mean, that's the only two conditions that will happen. So this is what is written there actually. And uh, we are telling, okay, don't worry about the entire interval, but limit our analysis to a small interval. Okay, it can be zero everywhere else. We don't care about that. Okay. We one particular example where within this interval t a t b okay, the function is either completely greater than 0 strictly positive throughout or strictly negative throughout. Okay, it is possible right I mean as long as t a t b is very small it is possible you are taking that particular type of thing. Actually. So, remember the, then remember this is something uh, very interesting actually. Okay, so, delta of x okay, this delta x is can be arbitrary right. So, somebody can choose a delta of x something like this. Okay. Delta x is actually variation of uh, x basically, right. So, it can take any arbitrary thing and it talks about uh, this function is continuous and it can take uh, any variation sort of thing. So, we will choose a particular variation which is uh, non zero in, in that interval, that is all that is what it matters, all these math equations aside. Okay. We are considering that particular case where g of t is non zero in a small interval at least, it is everywhere else it is 0 and we are we are selecting a particular variation for which in this interval t a t b the value the function the variation value is non zero and it is strictly one sided. Okay. It is non zero does not mean it can change sign and all that actually it, that is the type of variation we are selecting it is because we are free to select any variation we want actually that way. Okay. So, as long as this is completely one sided and this is completely one sided, the, the integral of that whatever integral you are talking about here, it can turn out to be something like that and hence it is non-zero because if you multiply 
any positive quantity or negative quantity with any positive or negative quantity here throughout basically okay then you will end up with a non zero value that's what it matters actually okay, it need not be positive or negative or anything like that it just requires that the integral is non zero okay but what it tells you it is that is not allowed basically right because this is the requirement of the theorem it tells you that this has to be true and here is a case where this is not true basically okay why it happens because fundamentally we assume that g of t has some non zero value in this interval actually okay so as long as it's a very within a very small interval this g of t happens to be non zero we can always be smart to select some sort of a variation which is non zero and once with that particular interval and claim that this integral is non zero okay so using that concept i mean using that idea this you can tell that okay if you if that also is not allowed then the only way it cannot happen is if you, uh, the function is continuously zero throughout actually okay. if it is continuously zero there is no interval t a t v in between where it can take some some uh, value like this i mean one sided value where i can be smart and select some some variation around that okay that's the whole idea there okay. so it's a very interesting theorem it tells you that if this happens to be okay this happens to be true okay for every continuous function g of t if this this happens to be true where this variation delta x is continuous function is in that then this g of t have, must be equal to 0 throughout the interval actually okay so very interesting kind of ideas there actually okay now coming moving further we talk about this necessary condition of optimality okay so what's the problem here problem is to kind of uh, optimize this cost functional now it is uh, this functional uh, what you are talking about here is a function of both x and x dot as well as independent variable t actually okay so what's the idea here we want to optimize this uh, cost functional or cost function uh, by appropriate selection of uh, this x of t and here we'll consider this t0 t f for both are fixed and what the solution the solution tells the for using this fundamental theorem and all it tells necessary condition that the first variation has to be equal to 0 okay so if you use this the first variation equal to 0 okay that part will not be able to prove in this course probably you just take it for granted and it is very intuitive also i mean if you see this uh, pictorial ideas and all it's very intuitive actually i mean any, any any arbitrary variation you take the function has to increase and if i really have optimum value then at that point of time Uh, the variations will not lead to any improvement actually that means the first variation has to be zero basically that way. so that that kind of ideas this now if you if you talk about that and use this the, this result first variation equal to zero then you will end up with very two interesting equation An equation is called uh, very famously called euler lagrange equation and uh, um, the other equation is called something called transversality condition essentially in a simpler language it will give you something like a boundary condition actually Okay. okay and remember that this boundary condition can uh, can like part of the equation might have already been satisfied by problem formulation itself that means suppose you talk about initial condition being fixed you know the initial condition for sure there is no variation around that then you talk about okay delta x is zero anyway okay. so if delta x is zero this equation is zero at t zero basically so that is part of the equation is already satisfied on the part of the equation you can you can get it from this uh, this transversality condition actually now a little bit interesting history part of it this uh, this uh, el equation is, is first actually derived by euler and who happens to be quite uh, kind of senior to lagrange actually but then lagrange came up with some sort of a uh, i mean the euler's idea were all about discretization and all if you discretize and then to have uh, play around with the math and all it is easy to so uh, the the this el equation uh, in simply or simpler algebra and all that but some point of time this uh, like mathematicians are not comfortable with discretization process itself actually so they like this ideas of uh, calculus actually because that is uh, rigorousness and things like that so using this calculus ideas and all uh, lagrange which which are, who was an kind of an avid follower of euler they came up with an alternative derivation which we'll see in a second now okay and that derivation euler kind of liked it very much so he prescribed to the world that okay that approach should be followed not the discretization approach per se basically so people have kind of forgotten that part of history but ultimately it will it will kind of result to the same equation anyway so this is uh, kind of famously known as el equation or euler lagrange equation actually okay. so this is what it is uh, so let us go back and try to see what is going on there uh, so the proof part of it uh, uh, is what i'm talking about 
So, this is the problem we have got an x of t and you have got an x star of t which we claim that it is an optimal path actually optimum path. So, the corresponding variation function is what you are talking about here is x of t minus x star of t the difference part all over actually. Okay. So, this is what I am claiming x star is an optimum solution and x star plus delta x is some adjacent solution actually. Okay. So, what is the delta j then j minus j star it can be kind of written like that j happens to be this one by definition okay. and j star happens to be that by definition. Okay. So, if I if I combine these two I can talk about l minus uh, l of all these minus l of all these star values okay. and that is nothing but delta l actually. Okay. So, essentially I can represent delta j as an integral of delta l times e t. Now, what is delta l we have to analyze that and delta l is nothing but l of all that remember this is x x dot and t x is nothing but x star plus delta x and similarly like this actually. Right. So, delta l is like this and uh, I mean l of all these star values and l of uh, sorry all these st uh, star values plus delta x and uh, plus delta x dot like that and minus l of the star values actually. So, if you see this expression this is again gives us a scope to analyze it using Taylor series actually and uh, as I keep telling this Taylor series happens to be our backbone of all engineering ideas actually. So, we will uh, repeatedly keep on using this this Taylor series ideas. So, okay, now coming back uh, this delta L is nothing but L of that minus L of this. Okay. So, using this uh, this Taylor series ideas we will end up with something like that with higher dot terms and uh, neglecting again this higher dot terms and all we can now tell that this delta L tends to this variation delta L okay, first variation sense. Okay. If, I come, if I keep only the first variation quantities and all is nothing but that okay, because I am neglecting the higher dot terms here. Okay. So, you, now what happens this delta j is tends to that or approximately equal to this uh, this delta j rather which the variation of uh, first variation of j and that can be represented like that because this is this one delta j is nothing but that and delta l turns out to be something like this. So, using these two I can uh, you can write that delta j tends to this delta j okay, variation j is nothing but that putting there actually. Now, it is the time to analyze this one okay, where you lead to and things like that. So, the problem here is this term because we know what is variation of x we really do not know what is variation of x dot really okay. and uh, these two are not really extremely arbitrary quantity you cannot select one extremely independent of the other because one is a function of time and the other one is derivative and the variation of that actually. So, they are kind of related to each other actually in a way. So, we have to account for that actually. Okay. So, what happens here this quantity is what you are our concern and this quantity by definition what you are talking here this is that term, but by definition this variation of x dot is nothing but d by dt of variation of that is just definition. When you talk about uh, delta of x dot is nothing but d by dt of dx I mean delta x basically. So, now here is an opportunity the to, uh, to use this integration by part. Now, you talk about this is one function and this is another one. So, let me do that integration by parts. So, I talk about uh, using that integration by part. So, the first function times the integral of the second function okay, minus integral of the derivative of the first one into integral of the second one and all that actually integration of everything. Okay, so, just nothing but integration by parts actually. So, if you do that what happens now is very interesting because dt dt is kind of uh, appearing here the various derivative and integration no need to do that. So, it result in only delta x. So, del x del l by del x dot into delta x okay. you can evaluate this uh, this integral now and similar thing will also happen here. So, what you will end up with okay, d by dt of this term multiplied by del x into delta y. Now, if you look at this term to this term this term contains variation of x dot and all that this term does not contain variation of x dot. It contains partial derivative with respect to x dot that is okay because that is that you can evaluate basically. And the result it all talks about variation of x only. So, in a way it nicely winds up this uh, this interdependency of this this variation and its derivative and all that actually. Now, go back uh, this is the two term one term and second term. So, second term we got some ideas. So, we will put them together and tell okay del j is nothing but first term plus second term and first term we will keep as it is second term we will uh, we'll put what we got right now. Okay. So, once you put that uh, this is how, how it is actually uh, this uh, this is the first term this is the first first term of the this this quantity. So, that comes here and that is the second term of that quantity which comes here. Okay. 
So, so what you are getting here after that uh, we can uh, we can talk about combining the first and last term. Okay, first term and last term we can combine, and then put it in the integral form here. Uh, and this one is not a function of n. This is not an, an integration process. So this will keep it aside actually. Okay. So what you are talking here that you are talking about just a simplification of delta j in terms of that. Okay, it talks about only variation of x and integration with respect to dt basically. Okay. So we have a term, okay, which is an integral term, and we have a term which is outside the integral actually. Okay, what what it tells us the the fundamental theorem. What does it tell us? It tells us that the first variation has to be equal to zero. Okay, so first variation equal to zero. That means this quantity has to be equal to zero. Okay. Now we will go back and find out. Uh, okay, this quantity can be equal to zero, provided. Okay, this is independent of this integral process, so this has to be equal to zero. Okay, these two are kind of very independent quantities actually. Okay, so in in a way, this has to be equal to zero, and that integral term has to be equal to zero basically. Okay, because uh, that is what uh, we are demanding basically. Okay. Now, what happens to this quantity? Okay. This is clear actually, right? This this quant this quantity has to be equal to zero. That is clear. But what what about this quantity? Now we'll tell that if the integral is is zero throughout, okay, and the variation is continuous, okay, then we'll excite this theorem that we just discussed with proof and all that actually, okay. We'll tell the integrand value has to be zero throughout the throughout the interval, and that is what will lead us to this integrand value, whatever integral is there, that has to be zero throughout the throughout the interval t zero to t f actually. So that is how we'll get this famous E L equation. So we'll get this this E L equation is nothing but this integral quantity actually. Okay. So D L del L by del x minus d by d t of this quantity is equal to zero. It's famously known as E L equation. And then the second quantity is nothing but that that happens to be a boundary condition equation or transversality equation actually. Now couple of comments here that uh, the first equation that we are talking about uh, must be satisfied. Regardless of the end condition, remember this condition comes from the integral quantity. It doesn't talk about end condition actually. So this condition has to be true throughout the interval, okay? And that condition has to be true at the boundary points actually, okay? And as I told before, part of the second equation may already be satisfied by the problem uh, of uh, by the problem definition actually. If you talk about a fixed end point condition, like you start with a certain Uh, initial condition, then delta x zero is zero already basically. Okay, so that uh, that is not required. Okay. So how it is utilized by the way? This this one evaluated at t f minus this one the same one evaluated at t zero. That is equal to zero. That is how this equation is interpreted that way. The this value all evaluated at t f minus this same value all evaluated at t zero is equal to zero. Okay. So that is the that's the way of interpreting interpreting actually. Okay. Obviously, time for a, a small example problem to get our ideas a little more clear actually. So the whole idea here, I mean, the problem definition here is something like this: We want to minimize this quantity x dot square plus x and then into dt. This is a cost function to minimize with these boundary condition. Remember, this this boundary condition are fixed actually. X sub zero is two and x sub one is three. Both are tightly fixed. Basically, there is no variation around that particular those particular values basically. We want to do that. This minimization we want to do. So, what's the solution here? We will follow this L equation approach. Then, first we have to define this L. L is whatever is inside the integral. So, that is L is nothing but x dot square plus x in this particular example. Then, L equation tells that this condition has to be true. Del x by del L by del x minus d has to be zero. Okay. So, that means if you plug it back, this L definition here, then del L by del x is nothing but one It's coming from here. Okay. So, this this is one. Okay, then d y d t of this one. So what is del L by del x dot? This is nothing but two x dot. Okay, and d y d t of two x dot is nothing but two x double dot. Okay, so one minus two x double dot equal to zero. Okay, that means x double dot is equal to half, and then you can integrate it rather easily. When x double dot is half, then x dot is nothing but uh, something like uh, half t plus. Okay, easy, right? I mean, it's that easy. When when something like this happens. The next x of x dot of t is nothing but uh, t by two, okay, and uh, x double dot of t something like I mean x sorry x of x of t is an integral of that and things like that that way. So this is something like c one. I mean 
x dot is nothing but T by 2 plus C 1. So, x of T one more time integration. So, that is T square by kind of 4 T square by 4 plus C 1 T plus C 2 ok. That is what is written there ok. okay. So, this one I can give is already there anyway actually ok. So, you from this equation x double dot is half you get x dot is T by 2 plus C 1 and if you integrate it one more time you will get t square by 4 plus c 1 t plus c 2 that is how we will get actually. So, it has two constants c 1 and c 2 which needs to be evaluated at the boundary using the boundary conditions. Now, what is the boundary condition available x of 0 is 2 and x of 1 is 3. So, you put x of uh, 0 is 2 that will give you if you evaluate that at x of 0 that means t equal to 0 this is 0 this is 0. So, this is nothing but 2. So, 2 equal to c 2 that is what you directly get it here ok. And if you evaluate the other one that x of 1 equal to 3 then x of 1 is uh, t, t is nothing but 1. So, it is 1 by 4 plus c 1 plus c 2 1 by 4 plus c 1 plus 2 now because c 2 is 2 has to be equal to 3 that condition actually. Okay. So, you put that back and evaluate c 1 and c 1 happens to be uh, something like this 2 minus 3 minus 2 is 1 already minus 1 by 4. So, that happens to be 3 by 4. So, the final solution happens to be this one actually yeah. that is how you solve it this very simple scalar problem with two fixed boundary problem boundary conditions actually. But remember if this you may not have this kind of luxury all the time actually. And also a small comment the transversality condition is automatically satisfied because there is no variation around that these are these are tightly fixed there. So, no variation these two are 0. So, this quantity what you see here the delta delta x t f is 0 and delta x t 0 is also 0. So, this this condition is automatically satisfied you do not have to worry about that. You do not get anything ext any extra information from there that is already embedded when you talk about fixed boundary conditions like that ok. What happens to the next equation I mean you could see is an example is a very same problem very similar looking problem j is same and x of 0 is 2 which is also same, but now x of 1 is is free is not fixed actually ok. Then we will see that the solution nature changes actually. Okay. How do you do the how do you see that ok uh, this part of the equation remains same L is same and the L equation is same this equation is same and hence the generic form is same ok. But when you start evaluating the boundary condition now again the first boundary condition is same. So, again C 2 is 2 that is fine, but the second boundary condition we cannot evaluate anymore. So, we have to go back to that transversality condition and tell ok del x by del x dot into d x f ok minus del s del l by del x dot uh, into d x 0 I mean whatever the this equation is 0. Now, d x 0 is 0 that part is all right ok, but first first part we will have to extract actually because that is that is not 0 in general because x f is free. So, it can take any value. So, delta x f is can take any value basically ok. So, we will uh, so that part if that happens then this coefficient corresponding coefficient has to be 0 that is that uh, what will give us another value actually. So, this equation has to be true, but this is not 0 in general. So, the coefficient has to be 0 ok. If coefficient is 0 then del l by del x dot del l by del x dot is nothing but 2 x dot right ok. So, 2 x dot evaluated at t f equal to 1 remember that is more important actually this happens only at the boundary. So, t f is 1 here ok. So, 2 x dot evaluated at t f equal to 1 that has to be 0 and what is 2 x dot remember x dot is that ok we just derived that I mean it's x dot is because x dot is that. So, 2 x dot is something like this ok. Mm -hmm. All right. So, this is uh, this we will get some value there actually. So, you just evaluated that uh, I mean evaluate that del l by del x dot equal to 0 del l by del x dot happens to be something like this ok. So, 2 of that and then put it equal to 0 sort of thing actually ok. Uh, in fact, if 2 x dot happens to be uh, sorry one second ok 2 x dot happens to be 0 ok uh, ok. Then x dot is also 0 ok. So, that is what is happening that the small algebra mistake here. So, uh, let me try to correct it the 2 x dot is 0 then then 2 is not necessary x dot is also 0 basically. So, when you x dot is 0 then x dot is nothing but uh, that what you what is have it here. So, that is what is getting used here actually. So, c 1 is nothing but uh, uh, minus 1 because t f is 1 remember that. So, 
C1 happens to be minus half. So, what is the solution? The solution is like this. So, in one case you will end up with a solution something like this, in the other case you will end up with a solution something like this. So, very different actually. Just because one case the bound the final boundary condition was fixed at a value, the other condition tells about it is a free value actually. And remember free means it can be far away from this value, we do not care actually. Okay. And that is why it gives you a different solution actually. Okay. Okay. So, this is what uh, was the fun of our uh, I mean kind of uh, very interesting to see in, in calculus of variation ideas actually. Okay. Now, transversality condition in general we can talk about something like this. So, first we derive this part of the condition, but in general if t is also phi also variations can happen in, in initial time as well as final time. So, in, in all our derivation here we assume that uh, this uh, t 0 and t f these are fixed actually. Okay. But suppose they are also, I mean, they can also vary. That means uh, you don't know the initial time. It uh, you, uh, you allow some flexibility for that, and you don't know the arrival time. You also allow some flexibility of that. That means uh, the TF is also kind of flexible. Then you can have, I mean, that pro those problems are also allowed in the in the framework of calculus of variation. And in those derivations, okay, you go through that. Then you end up with something like this, okay. Right. And also remember this this minimum time solution problem and all that this happens to be a very critical information actually. Okay. When you talk about XF, I mean, TF is uh, free and you want a minimum time also sort of thing. That kind of formulation we will see as you go along later, but you will see that this transversality condition is very handy actually. Okay. So, the, the fixed endpoint thing these are fixed. So, it does not give any additional information. If you give this condition, this T0, Tf are fixed, what we just derived, then the, these two quantities, this T0 and Tf both are 0. So, this this is gone. So, we will end up with that, that we derived. However, if T0 and X0 are fixed, okay, but free final time and free final state, then you talk about this now, because the T0 and X0 are there, I mean delta T0 and delta X0, the, those are 0, but the delta Xf and, uh, and delta Tf, those are not 0. So, we end up with some equation like this. Okay. Similarly, if these three are fixed what the pre final time then you will end up with some equation like this and uh, if all are fixed then you will end up with something like this actually. So, this is a trans general transversality condition kind of uh, embeds a lot of cases, lot of uh, uh, cases that are of interest to us actually. Okay. All right and there is a very special case that we discussed in the beginning that initial uh, time and uh, I mean x 0 are fixed. But this T f x f is constrained to lie on a given curve eta t. Okay, then what happens? So you will invoke this in this one. I mean transversality condition. But remember that delta x f is free, but in a constrained way. That means it has to set it has to lie on this curve. So that delta x f can be can be kind of expanded this way. Delta it d eta by d t into delta f sort of thing. And so it gives us uh, some delta x f is nothing but that basically. Okay. So, now you put it back and then I talk about okay, this is the whole thing multiplied by delta T f is 0, but delta T f is non 0 because uh, you are allowing some uh, freedom in the T f. So, this uh, coefficient has to be 0. So, that will give you this this uh, transversality condition uh, when you talk about uh, your final state are constrained to lie on a curve on a known curve eta of t basically. Okay. So, this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, these are the different different kind of uh, special cases. And all these things can be derived from, from the from this general transversality condition actually. All right. So one more example. Uh, it talks about uh, minimization of this uh, this functional, let's say, uh, with this condition x of zero is zero and t f x f should lie on this curve. This is the case that I'm talking here. Okay, so, yield equation is very straightforward del L by del x minus d by dt of del L by del x dot equal to 0, where L is nothing but the integral quantity. So, that is that is what it is in I mean integrand value whatever it is there. So, you just plug in the values d L by d x there is not a function of x. So, the partial derivative with respect to x is 0, but partial derivative with respect to x dot is not 0 because this is a function of x dot. So, you, you take the partial derivative with respect to x dot and then put it here. Okay. Then it turns out that d by dt of, of that we need to talk about. Okay. So, remember this is just the partial derivative of that quantity, but then you talk about derivative of that quantity with respect to time again that has to be equal to 0. And when you do that again this partial chain rule and all that you can bring in 
and tell okay this is the square of that which is like that and then I talk about this quantity into the derivative of that quantity minus the same quantity into derivative of the other quantity other function like that actually. this is some some f of x x dot divided by g of x dot sort of thing actually. so you use that formula properly when you take the derivative of that and ultimately you end up with the case where the 1 plus x dot square is always a positive quantity so we ignore that that you multiply that side it is zero and you end up with, you simplify this expression you end up with this some some equation like this actually okay. and this quantity this this quantity what you see here and this quantity will cancel out basically sort of thing and you end up with this 2x dot uh, uh, i mean 2x double dot equal to 0 that means x double dot is zero basically. so this first term this the second term and this term will cancel out so you will we left out with 2 and 1 is still there so 2x double dot zero so that means x double dot is zero real equation gives you that so, x double dot is 0 means again c x, x of t is nothing but c 1 t plus c 2 basically. Now, uh, the first boundary condition tells you that x of 0 equal to 0 that means uh, if I put 0 then c 2 is nothing but 0. So, I will end up with x of t is c 1. Now, the transversality other transversality condition will tell us something like this this, this one what is derived here and if you plug in that okay, that gives you some, some condition like that okay. and if you if you work out around, work it around then, then uh, this gives us this this constraint, constraint actually remember x of t is like that so x dot of f is nothing but x dot is nothing but c1 basically okay so five minus 5 c1 and c1 uh, tf is also c1 anyway so my minus 5 c1 is like that so c1 is something like that so that means x of t is nothing but just t by 5 actually and remember it is a free final time problem. So, Tf is also unknown, but if you really want to find Tf, then you put this constant equation Tf by 5 x of Tf is equal to that uh, the minus 5 Tf by plus 15 because that is to lie on that curve. Okay. So, if you constrain that equation and you find that value for Tf also basically. Okay. Now, before uh, stopping this lecture, if you talk about uh, what about sufficiency condition. Now, we will talk about the second variation of that first variation is all about necessary conditions anyway. So, use the second order Taylor series so, go through that uh, second order expansion and all you can write it that way. So, obviously, this gives us a condition that uh, you can define this uh, this Hessian matrix sort of ideas and if this matrix happens to be positive definite it is a minimum condition if it happens to be negative definite it is a maximum condition actually and neither of the above happens that, that means further math is required and obviously, we will not talk about that in this course actually. But remember that this matrix is time bearing in general okay. and hence in uh, one needs to guarantee that it remains positive definite in negative definite throughout the time uh, unlike static optimization. Static optimization these are values now these are function of time x star itself is a function of time x star dot is a function of time. So, this quantity is a function of time. So, when you talk about this matrix is a positive definite matrix that means, it is positive definite throughout the time interval actually that is what we are, we are mentioning here actually. Okay. So, you one has to guarantee that it remains positive definite or negative definite for, for all the time interval actually okay. and also remember this test what you are talking about second variation and all is valid only for free optimization problem because the entire thing we talked about free optimization actually okay. constraint optimization is not valid and further uh, things are required actually. So, with the, that I think we, we are ready to move forward a uh, uh, little more general concepts of, of vector related things and all I will talk about in the next class. But this particular lecture I, uh, I think uh, we have got sufficient knowledge about some ideas of calculus of variation and associated mathematics around that actually. So, I suggest that you kind of understand these concepts well before we proceed further. All right. So, I would like to stop here. Thank you.